All right, sixth graders, welcome to your lesson in conductivity. So I'm going to go through this website with you and help you understand the reading here. Uh, so it starts with, what is conductivity? And it says, conductivity is a measure of water's capability to pass electrical flow. So it's the ability of electricity to pass through water. This ability is directly related to the concentration of ions in the water. This is where it gets confusing. It's like, what is an ion? Uh, this one's heavy in chemistry. Uh, so let's take a look at this image here because it's really helpful. So we see here this O, H, H. That's two H's, one O, two hydrogens, one oxygen. We recognize that one as H2O, which is water. So we've got water molecules on both these pictures. Um, and we have a different molecule in each one. <coughs> this is Na for sodium, Cl for chlorine, because when a sodium uh, atom and a chlorine atom combined, uh, both very dangerous toxic chemicals, together they bond to form a, a chemical that isn't bad in large amounts, it's bad. That isn't bad for us because it's just salt. The regular salt you put on your food is NaCl, sodium chloride. Well, when there are salts in water, like sodium chloride, these are called chlorides. Other dissolved salts in water, like alkalis, sulfides, and carbonate compounds, these things are what make water conduct electricity better. So that gives you a higher conductivity. And because these uh, molecules have a positive and negative charge, that's why they're called ions. So when you see the word ion, it's an atom or a molecule, which is two or more atoms bonded together to form something completely different. Uh, that is an ion. Now it says here, compounds that dissolve into ions are also known as electrolytes. That word might sound familiar to you, which is why athletes drink Gatorade, because it has electrolytes. And when you sweat, you're sweating out the salts in your body, and you need to replenish them because those salts, electrolytes, we need to perform. So the more ions that are present, the higher the conductivity in water. And then the fewer ions, in the water, the less conductive it is. So if you've ever bought distilled or deionized water, deionized meaning they're taking the ions out to make sure it's just pure water, uh, that water says here it can act as an insulator because it's very low in conductivity. But then you get seawater, it's got so much salts and, and ions in it that it has a very high conductivity. And, and conductivity testing, we get to decide whether we do 0 to 200, uh, to 2,000, or to 20,000. If we were testing the conductivity of seawater in the ocean, we'd use the highest value because it has the most salts. Now it says here, ions conduct electricity due to their positive and negative charges. When electrolytes dissolve in water, they split and pH people w learned about water having a positive hydrogen ion and a negative hydroxide, the O and the H, uh, oxygen and hydrogen bond, uh, negative ion. Well, here's some cool vocabulary. Um, positively charged ions are called cations, and negatively charged ions are called anions. And as they split in water, the concentration of each positive and negative remain equal because you have one of each. This means that even though the conductivity of water increases, the more ions go in there, it's still electrically neutral because you're adding salts with one positive, one negative. Pretty cool. Now, conductivity with the lab quest we're using micro Siemens per centimeter, which uh, is U, lowercase u, capital S, slash CM. 
We don't do millisiemens micros enough because there's so little of it in, in our fresh creek water. Uh, it's also reported in micro mos, but we're not going to use micro mos. We're using micro siemens, and the good news is a micro mo is equal to a micro semen. So they mean the same thing. Uh, we just use one or the other. Now, when you're reading this, you can skip specific conductance and resistivity unless you're going to go into electrical engineering or you want to learn about it. Then I would read that and do some research on it because just reading these paragraphs here, it's going to totally confuse you. We're also skipping uh, conductance because that's more than what we need to know. But related to conductivity is this thing called salinity. Uh, a basic definition, salinity is the total concentration of all dissolved salts in water. And remember, these salts are ions, also known as electrolytes. Uh, and these electrolytes form what's called ionic particles. So ionic particles just means they have a positive and negative charge. So salinity is a strong contributor to conductivity. The higher the salinity, the higher the conductivity. So while salinity can be measured by a complete chemical analysis, that we don't do. It's too difficult and time consuming. Uh, and, and requires things like evaporating seawater. So we don't measure it directly, but we get an idea of the salinity from our conductivity measurement. And they call that practical salinity. Now, I'm gonna skip to here. Um, there are many different dissolved salts that contribute to the salinity of water. So what we don't know for sure, because we don't have a test for it, is which one of these different salts or chlorides or carbonates are in Chimicum Creek. Uh, I think, pretty sure that we've got magnesium and calcium because water here tends to be hard and hard water refers to having a lot of magnesium and calcium, which are okay minerals. So if you drink magnesium and calcium, that's all right. Uh, I don't think it has sodium chloride salt, but then again, I'm not sure. So there's sodium and chloride right here, magnesium and calcium. And, and these pictures represent a visual of the atom because each smallest particle of these substances we call an atom. If you get any smaller than that, it's no longer uh, sulfur or magnesium or calcium. So that's important things you'll learn in chemistry in high school and beyond. Uh, so many of these ions are also present in freshwater sources, which is why we don't get zero conductivity. We got uh, a little over 200 with the 0 to 200 one. So I switched it to the 0 to 2000 and got over 300. So our fresh water um, has a little more than than fully fresh water, which means there are definitely a bunch of salts present in there, but nowhere, nowhere near as much as the ocean. But it tells us a lot about our creek. Um, this gets into how to do absolute salinity and salinity units. We don't need to get that far into it, but this one's important too. So we learned conductivity, how well, electricity flows through water. Uh, salinity, how much salts are in the water, is what causes more conductivity. More salts, ions, electrolytes, positive negative charge, higher conductivity, easier for electricity to flow. But it also tells us about dissolved solids, stuff that is dissolved in the water. So for drinking water, it says here, ideal is 0 to 50 milligrams per liter of dissolved solids. Ideally, you don't want anything in your water but pure water. Zero is best. Anything over 50, you have to filter it. Um, and that's why a lot of us use filters in our home to filter our water from things like this. 
Over 100 is what I called hard water. It's got calcium and magnesium. And then look at it. Average tap water has from 200 to 400 milligrams per liter of dissolved solids. Total dissolved solids, otherwise known as T, D, S. Um, you can see two to 300 is marginally acceptable, but if you get over 300 and you're nearing 400, that's high total dissolved solids from tap. So that could be mineral springs. Think about it. Springs with minerals in them. That's higher total dissolved solids. Uh, anything over 500, the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, says that's the maximum. We shouldn't go over that. So you can probably think total dissolved solids, or TDS, combine the sum of all ion particles that are smaller than a teeny tiny two microns. A micron is a millionth of a meter. That's a micro meter. That's a very tiny. And this includes all of the what they call disassociated electrolytes that make up salinity concentrations. So it's all those atoms uh, like salts that have a positive or negative charge, including what we call dissolved organic matter. So organic means it was once living, like plants and fish and bugs. When they die and decompose, they leave behind their organic matter. Now, in clean water, TDS is approximately equal to its salinity. Once the water gets polluted, it adds organic uh, stuff, solutes like hydrocarbons from oil and gasoline, and, and urea, which comes from urine, pee, in addition to the salt ions, so it just messes up the the total reading um so it says here while tds measurements are derived from conductivity some states use a tds maximum instead of a conductivity limit for our uh project we're going to report conductivity and mention salinity in total dissolved solids um but that's about it so you guys need to learn from the uh, turbidity team because they can show you what type of solids they got in the water to get the high turbidity and they can tell you the turbidity so we can see if our water's clear. Now this part here, depending on the ionic properties, too much dissolved solids, that's what that means, can produce toxic effect on fish and fish eggs. Salmonids, salmon-like chum and coho that we have in our creek, but salmonids also include trout, the rainbow trout and the cutthroat trout in our creek. Exposed to higher than average uh, calcium sulfate, that's CA for calcium, S is sulfur, O is oxygen, but when one sulfur bonds with four oxygens, that's a sulfate. Um, so higher than average calcium sulfate at various life stages, those salmonids experience reduced survival and reproduction rates. So they don't survive as well when there's a lot of calcium sulfate in the water and they have problems when they're laying their eggs and trying to fertilize them. So when the total dissolved solids ranged above 2,200 to 3,600 milligrams per liters, Salmon, perch, and pike all showed reduced hatching and egg survival rates. So that wasn't good. So dissolved solids are also important to aquatic life by keeping their cells in their bodies balanced. Um, and this is pretty cool. If, if you were to put uh, fish in distilled or deionized water, the water will flow into their cells, making them swell. In water with very high total dissolved solids, the water will go out of their cells into the water because it goes from where there's less salts to where there are more salts, then their cells will shrink. Uh, and that will mess with a fish's ability to move in the water. And it'll either float or sink beyond its normal range. So it, it affects the fish quite a bit. Total dissolved solids also affects the taste and will make the water uh, more alkaline, which is 
what pH uh, team is learning is basic or harder water. Um, this paragraph here starts by saying that total dissolved solids are reported in milligrams per liter. But the question is, can we convert our micro siemens to milligrams per liter? I'm glad you asked that question. So there is a way. It's a bit complex, but we can use this table. Um, what we do is we take the conductivity value in micro siemens per centimeter and we have to multiply it by a constant, that is a number, that will give us uh, an average total dissolved solids. So our conductivity is between 84 and 447, um, so we're going to get a, a uh, looks here, our constant will be between 0.48 and 0.5, which should break down into TDS per potassium chloride, sodium chloride, and then parts per million per factor. So we'll work on this to figure out what number to multiply it by to get total dissolved solids. And it'll be estimated because I'm not an expert at this and uh, we'll have to go through it and figure it out. So this section requires some special attention. Now conductivity we learned is important because it can affect fish uh, and, and their eggs and their ability to reproduce and survive. But also, um, heavy rains and evaporation. So heavy rain, flow rate team can tell you, will cause stream flow to be bigger, more water flowing. Evaporation reduces the stream flow. Um, but it also affects conductivity. Runoff or flooding over soils that are high in salts or minerals can cause a spike in conductivity even though there's more water. So it depends on the water coming into the creek to flood it. Is it just fresh rainwater or is it carrying salts from the soils and the sand and whatever it's flowing through? So that's how it, how conductivity combines or matches with flow rate. So we've seen conductivity with turbidity and conductivity with flow rate. And look at this. Dissolved oxygen is also a, a factor. As the dissolved oxygen team is learning, the warmer the water, the less dissolved oxygen it can hold. Well, guess what? Seawater, because it has higher conductivity, way more salts and ions, uh, cannot hold as much dissolved oxygen as fresh water because it's higher in salinity. So this graph is important to teach the uh, DO people. And then here we see a um, graphic showing what type of fish can uh, stand higher salinity and what type of fish can't. So basically it's breaking down freshwater fish down here and saltwater fish uh, up here. And then these are in the middle they can have waters that have more salinity, higher conductivity. Uh, so this is a good section to read. And that's about it. That's as far as we will get. So there you have it. Yeah, there's a lot here. Conductivity is important, complex, and includes some chemistry.